Welcome to this podcast on an integrated scenario. This will involve a discussion about a particular scenario which will be discussed in the podcast and all the questions will be related to the hardware, software, internet and networking, data and information and solution development related and applied to this integrated scenario. These topics are from question 6 of the 2023 Information Technology November Paper 2 exam or theory exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video first. The link to the PDF is in the video description. Then go and attempt those questions. And finally, come back and listen to the podcast so that you can compare the discussion with your answers. If you want to use the podcast to learn your information, then first listen to the discussion, then download the questions, the PDF link in the video description mentioned earlier, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about how the different forms of computing can be applied to this integrated scenario. And now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about this particular scenario. Ever been to a school open day and uh, actually thought about all the tech humming away behind the scenes? Hmm. Probably not consciously. Right. Like how you sign in, maybe those virtual tours online. It's all computers, really. It is. So today on The Deep Dive, that's what we're doing. We're looking at the computing stuff, the tech and ideas that make an open day actually work. We're using some uh, questions and answers as our guide, focusing on a sort of school scenario. Exactly. The mission is simple. Unpack this tech. Make it interesting, sure, but also, you know, connected to what you might be learning about computers right now. Yeah, it's a great way to see these concepts, like in the wild. Yeah. How a real event uses everything from networks to web tech to um, data management. It makes the theory much more concrete. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Prospective students arrive, maybe they hit a registration desk. Increasingly, you see QR codes being used there. Hmm. So, first question. What is a QR code and how is it captured? A QR code. Um, it's basically a 2D barcode, you know, the regular ones on groceries yeah. like that, but way more powerful, holds more data, like a web address <sighs> and capturing it. Super simple. Just put your phone's camera at it. So the camera app just reads the pattern. Yeah. Or a dedicated QR app. It sees the black and white squares, decodes them and bam, usually it's a link in this case, probably to an online sign up form. Got it. Like a fancy barcode shortcut. So you scan it, get to a web page. And sometimes, you know, when you start typing your name or email and it just fills itself in. Oh, yeah. Autofill, lifesaver. How does that happen? That's the next question. Well, it's usually a few things working together. Uh, first, your browser itself probably has that autocomplete or autofill feature built in. It remembers stuff you've typed before. Okay. Second, the website might use cookies little files stored in your computer. They can remember preferences, maybe login details, or info you entered last time. Right. Could and third, sometimes your phone's operating system, or maybe an app you're logged into, stores your details securely and offers to pop them into forms for you. So different digital helpers remembering bits of info to speed things up. Okay, now what about people who can't physically be there? Many schools offer a 3D tool on their website. Mm -hmm. Becoming quite common. Making those probably takes some serious computing horsepower. One question mentions using a computer with multiprocessing. So what is multiprocessing, simply put? Multiprocessing, uh, fundamentally, it's about the computer using more than one processor, or more often these days, multiple cores inside a single processor chip to handle tasks simultaneously. Like having several brains working at once. Exactly like that. So for something complex like rendering a 3D tour you can walk through online, it's not just faster, it allows for you know richer detail, smoother interaction. It really enables that kind of experience. Okay, so multiple cores running things. How does the computer's OS, the operating system, juggle all that, make sure the 3D tour runs smoothly and doesn't like crash? Ah, uh, yeah, that's crucial. Resource management. The OS acts like a, um, a traffic cop. It makes sure each process, each part of that 3D tour software gets its fair share of CPU time, memory, access to the hard drive, everything it needs. Without stepping on each other's toes. Precisely. It tries to prevent one demanding task from starving the others, aiming for that smooth, responsive feel when you're clicking around that virtual school. Nice analogy. Okay, sticking at the website, next question. Hey. Why does a website often load way faster the second time you visit it? The answer points to web caching. What's that? Web caching. 
Right. So the very first time you go to a site, your browser has to download everything, text, images, the code behind the page from the website server, which could be far away. Okay. Makes sense. Caching is basically your browser keeping a temporary copy of some of those downloaded bits, images, style sheets, common stuff on your own computer or phone in its cache. A local copy? Exactly. So next time you visit, the browser goes, oh, I already have this picture, and loads it from your local cache instead of fetching it all the way from the server again. Much faster. It's like a browser shortcut for websites you use a lot. Clever. Now, that 3D tour video, the material mentions it can be downloaded or streamed, and it asks us to discuss the rise of streaming over downloading. We definitely stream more now, don't we? Oh, massively. It's yeah. really shifted. And I there are um, definite trade-offs. Streaming gives you that instant gratification, right? Click play. It starts. No waiting for a big file. No using a precious storage space on your device. Yeah, storage is a big one. But you need a good, stable internet connection. No internet, no stream. Plus, you don't really own the stream content. You're kind of renting access to it. Right. And downloading. Downloading takes time. Uses storage. Yeah. yeah. But once it's there, it's yours. Watch it offline whenever you have more control. The big driver for streaming, though, is definitely faster, more reliable internet becoming widespread. Convenience often wins out. Yeah, that makes total sense. Okay, let's switch gears slightly. The material describes the sample open day website as being web 1.0 generation. For listeners maybe not familiar with the internet's history, what did web 1.0 sites look like? What were their characteristics? Ah, web 1.0. The early days, like early 90s to early 2000s, yeah. it was simpler, definitely. Two key things, mostly static pages. The content didn't change much unless the creator updated it manually. Okay, static, like reading something fixed. Pretty much. And users were primarily consumers of information. You read, you click hyperlinks to navigate, but you didn't really interact or create content on the site itself. Designs were basic, often just HTML, maybe a bit of CSS later on. No fancy interactive stuff. So more like an online brochure than, say, Facebook. Exactly. What drove the change then? Why did we move from that static web 1.0 to the interactive web 2.0 we have now? Well, a few big things converged. One was definitely a user desire. You know, mm -hmm. people wanted to participate more share their own thoughts, pictures, connect with others, not just consume. So the social aspect started driving it. Big time. That led to blogs, forums, eventually social media. And alongside that, the technology evolved. New programming languages, databases, ways to make sites dynamic. Plus, crucially, internet speeds got much faster and more people got online. Mm. That combination made Web 2.0 possible, interactive, user-generated content, richer media. Okay, that evolution makes sense. Now, let's circle back to the data collected from those registration forms, QR code scans, online forms. We're told it all goes into an online database. Mm -hmm. And there's an example of inconsistent grade entries. Seven, seven, GFE seven, grade seven. Why is that kind of messiness a problem for data quality? Oh, that's a classic data quality issue. It highlights why standardization is so important. Because even though all those entries mean the same thing to us, to a computer processing the data, seven and seven are totally different strings of text. Right. The computer doesn't understand the meaning. Exactly. So if the school wants to, say, count how many seventh graders registered or sort the list by grade or analyze trends, this inconsistency makes it incredibly difficult. You can't easily group them, compare them accurately. It introduces errors, makes analysis unreliable. Messy data leads to messy insights, basically. Precisely. Garbage in, garbage out, as they say. So how could the school fix its form to prevent this? What are maybe a couple of techniques? Yeah, there are good ways to guide users. Uh, one of the best is using selection controls like a drop-down menu. Ah, where you just pick from a list. Exactly. Predefined options, grade 7, grade 8, etc. The user can't type it wrong. Or you can use radio buttons. Another way is just providing clear instructions or an example right next to the field, like enter grade, yeah. for example, 7. Okay. You could maybe even use something called an input mask, which forces the input into a specific pattern, though that might be overkill for just a grade number. Drop-downs are usually best for this. Makes sense. Guide the input from the start. Now, this raw data, it's not just collected. It needs to be used for decisions. There's a fill-in-the-blanks question about the information cycle. Data goes TOA, which goes TOB, leading to decisions. What fits in A and B? Right. This is about turning raw data into something useful. Right. So data, those raw facts like 7 or DIT7, needs to be processed first. That's step A. Processing turns data into information, organizing it giving it context, making it meaningful. Like knowing seven refers to the grade level. Okay, so A is processing or information. 
Then what's B? Step B takes that information and turns it into knowledge or insights. This involves analyzing the information, interpreting patterns, understanding what it means in a broader context. So seeing trends in the registration data, understanding which grades show most interest, it's this knowledge that allows for good decision making. Data to information to knowledge to decisions. Got it. Now, the scenario mentions this school is part of a franchise, Learn More School, and they use a distributed database. Why would that be better for a franchise than just one big central database? Good question. For a franchise with multiple locations, a distributed database has several advantages. Uh, first, performance. Each school can primarily access and update its local data, meaning less traffic jamming up a central network. It spreads the load. Okay, faster locally. Right. It also scales better, handles more users across all schools, and accessibility, each school needs reliable access to its own student info. Plus, it can be more stable. If one school's database server has an issue, it might not take down the entire system for everyone else. So, better speed, handles more people, more reliable overall for separate branches, makes sense. But sending private student info over networks, security is key. Encryption comes up. How does encryption basically work to protect data? Encryption? Uh, in simple terms, is scrambling data. It uses a mathematical algorithm and a secret key to turn readable information into unreadable ciphertext. Like a secret code. Pretty much. So if that encrypted data is intercepted while traveling over the internet, it just looks like gibberish to anyone without the correct decryption key. Only the intended recipient with the key can unlock it and read the original message keeps prying eyes out. Now, within distributed databases, there are different ways to set them up, like partitioning or duplication. For this Learn More School franchise, which model might fit best and why? That's an interesting design choice. It depends a bit on their priorities. Partitioning means splitting the database up. Maybe each school gets its own partition or segment holding its local student data. This really helps with that local performance and management we talked about. Each school works mainly with its own chunk of data. Okay, partitioning sounds logical for separate schools. What about duplication? Duplication or replication means copying the database or parts of it to multiple locations. The big win here is redundancy and availability. If one server goes down, the data still exists elsewhere. Ah, uh, backup, essentially. Yeah, high availability. For the Learn More franchise, partitioning seems like a strong contender. Each school managing its own primary student records makes a lot of sense for efficiency and keeping data localized. They might still duplicate some shared info, perhaps, but partitioning the student records seems efficient. Okay, partitioning for local control seems like a good fit. Let's shift now to how schools actually tell people about open days. The question asks for two examples of digital communication platforms. So many options now. Oh, definitely. Digital comms are huge for this. Right. Uh, two obvious ones. Email is very direct. Schools can target lists of interested families, send personalized invites, details, links. Very effective. Right. Email is key. Another one. Social media. Platforms like Facebook, Instagram, maybe even TikTok, depending on the audience. Great for reaching a broad audience, building buzz, sharing visuals, event updates, Q&As. Very interactive. Yeah, social media is huge. Others could be the school website itself, online community boards, lots of ways. Absolutely. Blogs, online ads, local news sites. Now, sometimes things go wrong digitally. The scenario mentions confidential parent and learner info being distributed without consent. Yikes. If that happened, what policy document could the school use to justify disciplinary action? That's a serious breach. Schools absolutely need policies for this. The key one is often the Acceptable Usage Policy, or AUP. It outlines rules for using school tech resources, what's allowed, what's not, and the consequences of misuse, like sharing confidential data inappropriately. The AUP? Okay. There might also be a specific privacy policy detailing how personal data is handled and protected. And depending on where the school is, data protection laws like GDPR or POPIA would be highly relevant and provide grounds for action, too. An end user license agreement, ULA, might be relevant for specific software, but less so for general data handling. So AUP and privacy policy are the main school documents, a necessary reminder about digital responsibility. Okay, last topic, AI. The school's doing an AI workshop using ChatGPT. What are, say, two potential risks of using powerful tools like ChatGPT? AI tools like ChatGPT are amazing, but yeah, risks exist. One big one is um, accuracy and bias. Users might just accept what the AI says without fact-checking, but these models can generate incorrect or biased information. They hallucinate sometimes. Right, they can make stuff up confidently. Exactly. Yeah. A second risk is around, well, originality and copyright. 
ChatGPT is trained on vast amounts of text from the internet. Using its output directly could lead to unintentional plagiarism or copyright issues, as the source of its knowledge isn't always clear. Hmm. The plagiarism angle is tricky. Definitely. And there are others, too, like over-reliance potentially stifling critical thinking or concerns about data privacy based on the prompts you feed it. It's powerful but needs careful critical use. Really important points as AI gets woven into everything. So yeah. wrapping this up, it's kind of amazing when you step back and see all the computing threads running through something like a school open day. It really is. From that first QR scan, the website tech, the databases, managing info, even thinking about AI. Computer science is just integral. It makes the whole thing work, makes it more efficient, and changes how schools and potential students connect. Absolutely. And it really brings those concepts you learned about in computer class to life, doesn't it? Yeah. Seeing the practical application. Totally. Which leads to a final thought for you listening. Thinking about all this tech we've discussed, how do you imagine school open days might change even more in the future thanks to computing? Mm, good question. Maybe more personalized virtual tours using AI, real-time AI assistants answering questions. What else could change? And maybe think about your own role. As you study computers, how might you contribute to building or using these kinds of technologies down the line? Something to chew on. Definitely food for thought. Well, that's our deep dive for today. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, keep exploring the tech around you. If you found this podcast useful, then make sure that you leave a comment so we know to make more of them. Also, make sure that you are a subscriber to the At Mr. Long Computer Terms channel. It will really help the channel and support us. And follow us on TikTok at Mr. Long Education. And don't do it the long way, but do it the Mr. Long way.